This is probably one of the, the, the best stories to epitomize uh, Meech, right? And I mean, without Meech, obviously there's no BMF. So the day after, the night after I'm introduced to Meech here in Atlanta, uh, which was uh, October of 2013. Club Chaos, my man Vaughn, Big Vision, introduced me to him. He walks me in, I come in the club, he's working. Uh, he says, yo, there's somebody I want you to meet. I said, cool. So we walk in, we walk in through, you know, the VIP, whatever, whatever, and there's uh, the rope and two big security dudes standing there. And he walks over and uh, security dudes are standing there. They don't, they don't say anything to him, whatever. He lifts up the rope. I walk through, he puts it down, he walks me over and he goes, um, yo, this is uh, Meech. He said, Meech, let me introduce you to somebody. He said, this is Kavari, Kavari, that's, that's Meech. Now, I, I have no idea who he is. I have never heard of him, I have no idea who he is, never heard of the family, none of that. Um, I had been hearing from a, a young lady who's like a sister to me, uh, who's from Harlem, um, Shanae, Shanae was telling me like she was representing the magazine here for me for a while before I was able to actually finally get back here. And I lived here, my home was here, my house I owned is here, right? But I was never able to be here because I was too busy building from that end coming south. But she would take the magazines, I would send her magazines here and she would move them around and she was getting like $50 a pop for the magazine. So she kept telling me about these guys, whoever she, whenever she sees these guys, you know, they always buy the magazine, they love the magazine, they always give like $50, $100 for the magazine. I didn't know these were the guys she was talking about, right? So when Vaughn says, you know, this is Cavario, Cavario, this Meech, whatever, though, Meech reaches over, puts his arm around, he says, I know who he is, and walks off with me. And from that night, for the next, 35 days, we are together every single day, you know? Um, that night, I had sold my house. This is, I sold my house like a short time before this. I sold my house in 03, right? So maybe in April of 03. And uh, so when I come down, you know, I, I stay with a, a guy who was a good friend of mine at the time. Um, and he lived way, way, way out in the boondock some damn way. So you're hanging out all night, whatever, and then you got to go drive, and then, you know, you got to, you know, brave the highways, you know, maybe a little tipsy, whatever, whatever. And then he, once you get to where he lives, it's like a long, dark, like some place to die, yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know, uh, the next day, we hung out that night, tried to go to 112. They wouldn't let him in 112 because they had just beat the brakes off of some dude, like, the, the week before. So it's like, we, we don't care how much money you're spending. We don't, you ain't coming in here tonight, right? So um, I was with him until about 4 o'clock in the morning and then, you know, went on back to homie spot and then came back the next day and met him at the crib club that, a uh, spot we used to call Club Kitchen off of, uh, what you call it? Uh, I forget the name of the, Habersham, off of Habersham. So um, I'm in the house talking to him. There's an older Cuban dude, about 50 or so, and an older Mexican dude, or Mexican or Colombian dude. And um, so we're talking. It's just me, him, and these two guys. So we're talking, and, you know, he's telling me that, you know, he wants to be in Don Diva magazine. So, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, uh, what do you want to, you know, what do you want to do? What's the, what's the angle? He said, you know, I want us to be the only ones that, that's been in the magazine that uh, balling, getting money, you know, um, we ain't, but we ain't dead and we ain't locked up, you know. Um, you know, this money is, it, it, we ain't, uh, uh, we're not robbing nobody, we're not uh, stealing, we're not scamming, it's not fake money, it's not checks, you know, this is real money, real street money, you know, and you know, we want to, we want to, you know, we want to be the first ones in the magazine that's not dead and not in jail. And, you know, I'm, he's serious, but I know he ain't serious. So 
I laughingly say, yeah, how long you think that's going to last after you get in my magazine? It's the hottest magazine in the country. When I say hot, I mean hot, hot. I mean, they all over this market. You know what I'm saying? Even though what I'm printing is actually public information that I just put together in a cognitive way, in a linear way, so it plays out like a story, but this is all actual, there's no crimes being solved in Don Diva. There's only the information being put into a, uh, a, a way that people can read it as a story. You know, um, but they read it. A cop pulled me over one day in Baltimore in the Don Diva van and was like, yo, can I get some magazines? Man, I love this magazine, man. They use it in my FBI training class. So I share that with him. He go, yeah, man, you just want to, you know, just want to do the shit, man. And, and, get it. and I'm like, yeah, nah, bro. So I asked the guys, the Cuban guy and the, and the Colombian, the Mexican guy, I said, uh, you understand what he's saying? And they go, yeah. I said, you don't think there's anything? He said, no, huh? I was like, what, what, what? am I in a Twilight Zone? <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? I said, brother, the only way you're gonna get on the cover of Don Diva magazine is if you sell a million records or get a million years. But there's no way in the world I'm going to facilitate the million years by putting you on this magazine as this, you know, criminal organization that's operating right now. Like, I'm not doing that. Yo, know, whatever you need, man, you know what I'm saying? Whatever, it's really, you know, whatever, how much? 20,000, 30,000? And now, mind you now, I'm writing everything, I'm doing all the distribution, I'm taking all the pictures, I'm, and I need money. This thing pays for itself. Barely takes care of me. Pays for itself. So I need this money, but I don't need it that bad. I don't need it so bad that I would negate my training and my upbringing as though I was some square journalist cat from, you know, fresh out of communication school or something like that. Oh, this guy wants to give me an exclusive. This will be hot. You know, nah, I'm of the thing. I'm not doing that. My, my OGs would be like, you know, after he gets jammed behind this, they'd be like, it's obvious that he didn't know any better, but why would you do that? Why would you help him? I'd be like, yo, man, I needed the money, man. Dude was waving money from him. They'd be like, nah, man, you ain't. That's not what your fabric. You ain't cut from that. You know? I couldn't do it. Needed that bread, but I couldn't do it. I could not do it. So, you know, that put him into perspective for me. It, it really did. You know, um, and at that point, to be honest with you, I was like, I, I want to... I want to get this guy out of here. I want to get him out of this goddamn thing. And from that point forth, bro, it was all about that. And we had uh, heated arguments about his behavior, about his choices, about his, you know, activities. And, you know, just I was just trying to get him to to move on. I said, brother, there's there's nothing more that you can do in this. You're going to have to. Move away from this in order for you to go to the next level. This right here, you've reached a point, a pinnacle, where it's only going to be redundant from here. It's not, there's not going to be any new experiences. Just the same, you know, varying degrees of the same shit. You're spinning wheels. Now, you're spinning luxurious wheels, and that might make you think you're in a better position than you actually are. But you're essentially just getting up every day, putting your head on a very uh, bedazzled, very shiny, very glimmery, chopping block and you know you got a, a platinum you know diamond pave axe above your head but your head is still on a chopping block you know and uh that was pretty much what it is like you know what it was we we hung out we kicked it you know we but as soon as he you know woke up we moving around this was the conversation i was having with him find something else to do. That's why in the conversation that I shared with the public, you know, um, back in 2011, um, when we talked, when he got his hands on that phone, um, you hear him say, yeah, I remember everything he was telling me, you know, but I couldn't, I couldn't just take my millions and disappear somewhere because I was the face and I was the this and I was the that. I was telling him way back then, sell every goddamn thing, start the rumor that you fell off, you started smoking and all kinds of shit, sell everything cheap and take your ass somewhere it don't matter where it is, and sit your ass down. Let them wonder what the hell happened to you. And come back when you're ready 
to be the next person, to be the next version of you. But if you stay here and you keep doing this, your ass is going to end up in prison with a bunch of damn time, you know? And that's what it was, man. Like every day that was pretty much, you know, I mean, I wasn't droning on it, you know, but whenever the window of opportunity presented itself, it made sense. I'd be like, yo, you see, you see what I'm talking about? You see, you see what I'm talking about? You see what I'm talking about? You know, um, another story is the night that, and he, he references this in the conversation, the night that the, uh, the Riz and Wolf were killed in Buckhead, that was day 22 of going out every single night, two or three joints every single night. Now we would start around seven because I would get up, I would go out, get in the Don Diva van and go to all my retail locations, driving all over the place, dropping off magazines and whatever this and the you other. You didn't sleep. And who? Uh, Meech. Meech? Or either mm. one of you, really? No, neither one of us slept. You know? Um, so we would get, we would, you know, get up around 12. We might not come in until 7, 8, right? But we get up around 12, 1. You know, I'd start running around. I'd leave the house, start moving around, moving my magazines. Uh, around 7, 7.30, uh, he would call me and say, uh, uh, come on to the house. I mean, we, you know, we're starting to get ready. This is now preparing to go out. So, you know, every day was a trip to the mall, get new outfits for... Not that they were needed, just, you know, nothing else to do. So, you know, get the outfits and come back and everybody's in the house getting dressed and all that, whatever. And the music's playing. We, we used to call the house Club Kitchen because we came in through the garage and right into the kitchen. And the music's playing. And we playing Jeezy new shit and we playing, the, you know, blues new shit. And there's a big bag of smoke and, you know, motherfucking uh, wheels everywhere, you know, pills. And, uh, and in the midst alcohol. of this, I mean, without going into detail, whatever, he's still having to make money. Oh, he is still, the, the machine is running like, you know, a Swiss watch. It's just running. In the midst of party. Yeah. Yeah. A lot was going on behind the party, bro. Is that the first time you saw something like that of using the party as the no that's, that's normal that's old that's old, old tactic but it was at a big bigger scale it, it was way see when I was coming up there were it, it, it was a, a a much more closed in scene so when cats in the street got together you know to connect as they schmoozed and socialized they were in an environment that was particular to them like particular to us. So we're in a club or we're in a, a, a after hours or we're in a, a bar, social, whatever, whatever. But it's really just players in there. It's really just street people in there. It's not really regular people in there, you know? And, you know, cats, they, you know, they're pulling up in whatever and, you know, wearing the beautiful things and all that, whatever, whatever. And they're getting in there and, you know, the music's playing and, you know, they, you know, what's happening, man? You know, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know, drop the bag over there, whatever, whatever. You know, yeah, order some more champagne, whatever. But it's all player shit, you know? It's just players in the room. This was some other shit. This was that, but like on a stage. Because everywhere we go, we're on, on this lift. Because that's how Atlanta is set up. We're on this lift, you know? And... Everybody's like looking up and you know, but it's going on. Cats are coming through and sitting down and chilling out and whispering in the air and whispering in the air and whatever, whatever, you know, shit like that. But you know, I mean, it's, it's a great environment for it because it's like, if you're ever asked, well, why are you and this guy to go? I'm in the club, he's in the club, we're in the club. You know, and you know they didn't pick it up in the conversation because you can't hear shit. We're this close to one another and we can barely hear each other. You know what I mean? So it was, it was a, a, a great place to put cover on your shit, you know? But we were running ragged, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, they popping pills. They, they drinking, you know, we drinking Cuervo. We doing, we doing shots with Cuervo. Every. every, you know, every 10 minutes doing shots with Cuervo. But on average, it's 30 of us, 40 of us sometimes, 50 of us sometimes. And everybody's got a bottle of champagne because he walks in the building and he buys every bottle of champagne they got. He doesn't care what it is. He buys every bottle. Every time we went to a club, he said, how many bottles of champagne you got? I want them all. So sometimes we stand there, each one of us got two bottles of champagne. 
So you're drinking all the champagne, you're smoking all those weeds, 12 blunts going around, right? Constantly, you, you puff it and a nigga passing you one. You, <laughs> and, you, and, and then, you know, he, he hold up the, uh, the, uh, the cap of the Cuervo, he poured in and, you know, he had a toast, we would say, and, you know, uh, down it and whatever and back to the, the other program and smoke and drink it. And we're going to be there for about an hour or so. If it's good, we'll be an hour and a half. Then we're gone. But now, remember now, you get called back to the crib around 7.30, 8 o'clock. When you come in, the weed, the pills, the alcohol is already flowing. Mother's getting dressed, whatever, whatever. It's already flowing. It's already flowing. We don't leave the house until 1.30 in the morning. He getting his hair fresh and braided, you know what I'm saying, whatever. You know, we, we only leave the house until 1.30 in the morning. Then we start going to the clubs. And it's two, three clubs in a single night, right? Um, so this particular night, we come in uh, this morning. And uh, it's like we were running ragged. And, and I knew, I said, I know that this is getting to the point where it's going to be volatile and dangerous because of the simple fact that I'm feeling volatile and I'm the most mature and responsible person here. And I'm getting to the point where, you know, I'm starting to meander and shit. I'm starting to, you know, get all aggressive because I'm underrested and, you know, you know, drinking and smoking and, you know, shit like that. I'm. I'm not in my right state of mind. So I said, I know where I'm at and I'm ready to, you know, bust a motherfucker in the head, you know, for you, you, you're not moving right. You're not acting. Right. I don't know who the fuck. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm reverting back to my, I'm out the street now. I'm retired six years by the time we meet. Right. So I got a lot of the street shit under control. I was like, yo, bro, we are about a night away from some fucked up shit really happening, right? Now, when I wake up um, this particular afternoon, he goes, yo, 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 come here, homie, let me show you something. We go into the garage, and he's got a brand new white convertible Ferrari, black top, white star rims, red interior, white uh, stitching all throughout the interior. Beautiful. We talking about the car, talking about, you know, how he outbid some, um, some white dude, whatever, whatever. He's very satisfied about that. He was more satisfied about having outbid the white dude who he felt was looking at this scruffy head, you know, bad braids, you know, you know, white t-shirt, big baggy pants, because our clothes were still big back then. And he just looked at, he said, the guy looked at me like, yeah, he ain't got no money. <laughs> and he outbid him. I, you know, he, a few hundred, you know, for that joint. So I was like, it's beautiful, yada, yada, yada. but we got to chill, though, bro. I said, we got to chill. We, I said, look at Bull. Bull happened to walk by. I said, look at Bull. Bull got the smoothest skin of all, man. It's Bull breaking the fuck out, bro. <laughs> look, like, like on some real shit. We need to chill the fuck out, man. Just stay in. Don't go nowhere. I got to meet with T.I. tonight. You know what I mean? Um, go to Patchwork, meet with him. We're going to shoot over to Magic City. And when we leave Magic City, I'm going to grab a couple of ladies, whatever, bring them on over. We're going to you know, hang out and kick or whatever. Don't leave. You know, don't go out. He said, all right, homie, we're going to chill out. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to wait for you to come back. So I'm in Magic City with T.I. Uh, I'm here. T.I.'s here. Tiny's getting a dance. And Wolf is standing about four feet away from us. Wolf gets on his phone, looks at the phone goes jetting out the door. So about an hour later, uh, I finished talking to him. He introduces me to Toomp. Me and Toomp is chopping it up. I go to the, um, the diner, Roswell Diner. Um, the diner on Roswell. I forget the, the name of it now, but it is uh, Landmark. I go to Landmark on Roswell, which is right off of Habersham, which the house is right around the corner. I stopped there. I said, yo, uh, I call. I said, I'm trying to see if somebody wants some food before I come in. So I'm sitting at the counter waiting for the food, and I'm looking up at the televisions they got up there, and I, and I see, you know, the cops, the scene, whatever, and they said, two, two men are killed in Bucket. I was like, oh, shit, motherfucking killing people in Bucket? The fuck? I said, I'm so glad that my family is not out because that would definitely get blamed on BMF. Cause I think they're in the house. So I get around to the house. Nobody's there. So there's another house, another big ass mansion around the corner. So I'm like, that's probably where everybody is. But I'm super tired. So I just lay my ass down. There's nobody there. 
for once you can get right. some sleep. Right. I just lay the fuck down and go to sleep, right? So I get I start getting calls around eight o'clock in the morning from everywhere. Yo, you all right? Yo, you all right? Yo, you all right? My man Big D from Queen said, yo, you okay? I heard about that shit. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you man, that shit happened last night? And I'm like, holy shit. The only thing I'm thinking about is that. I said, no, man. That did not happen. So um, a homie of ours pulls up, schoolboy. He pulls up and he's like, yo, yo, you got to help me, help me clean, clean the house up. So he starts gathering up all the you know, paraphernalia, weapons, you know, mostly just, just, you know, Rambo. guns and shit, right? I start picking up all the discarded cell phones, you know? Because, you know, I put this shit in Don Diva magazine with all these little things are that are done that people don't think about that get them jammed up. I'm like, get all the phones, and there's phones everywhere, phones that, that aren't being used no more, they burnt out, whatever, whatever, but they're still there, right? So I grab all the phones, grab the joints, we roll out. Um, Blue calls me, yo, homie, big homie, what to do? I don't know what to do. I said, well, since there's no telling what's happening, I said, I already got the call. This nigga's on the highway on their way here, okay? And so- From New York. Yeah. Because the beef could be out. Right, so don't, I said, definitely don't go out until we find out what the fuck is going on, you know? Uh, now, Meech got grabbed because he got hit and he's in, he went to the hospital and they found out who he was and they, they, had, they had them arrest him. And briefly, for those who don't know, explain how important Wolf was to New York. All right. Bigger than Wolf, New York Wolf was Puff's um, bodyguard and, you know, um, security, personal security, whatever, whatever. And, uh, you know, Wolf was a guy that was known and regarded, revered uh, by a lot of people. And um, that reverence, he leveraged that reverence to help him get access to the opportunity with working with Puff and also leveraged it to help Puff to circumvent certain situations, you know, uh, that would have been impediments for him, you know, had he not had somebody strong with him, right? Um, and of course, you know, all the things that happened, you know, with Suge's friend and, you know, supposedly Wolf having to have something to do with Suge's friend dying and all that, whatever. And that's what gave birth to that whole thing about Suge having an issue with, what you call it? So, um, you know, now this has happened. This has happened, you know, and, and he's, he's locked up or whatever, whatever. There's no evidence that, you know, there's, there's no evidence he shot, they tested him, you know, there's no evidence he shot a gun or any of that kind of shit, whatever, whatever. They just locked him up because he was him, you know? And that's when he knew that he, you know, was on Front Street, when they put his name in the paper and all that, whatever, whatever, and he knew he was on Front Street then. After that, the bowling, went to the next level. He was on house arrest for like six weeks or some shit like that. And when he got out, he bought himself the first Bentley GT to hit the street and the, and the first Phantom uh, to hit the street at the same time. Black, both of them. Bam, let's leave it at that and tell us, when, tell us in your next BMF story, what are you gonna tell us about? Um, in the next BMF story, I'm going to share the story about how we were in Miami at uh, Jackie Gleason's house, renting, he had rented Jackie Gleason's house and we were down there and we were gonna go to Source Awards and all that, whatever, whatever. And you know, the cars used to move from one place to another on a car carrier. So out, out front of this house, uh, they got a Phantom GT 650, um, Lamborghini, Ferrari, uh, 600 SL, you know, and these, two military attired uh, guys with M16s, one on, on this corner and another one on this corner. And this, this is in Miami in this uh, uh, high level, you know, um, wealthy neighborhood. Was it Brickle? Um, no, we, we, weren't, we weren't in Brickle. We, we were off of, uh, off of Al what is it, Alston, Al Alton? What is the name of it's that like near downtown. Yeah, we were we were right we were in the by the beach, oh. like you know maybe fifteen minutes from or ten minutes South from beach. South Beach, right? And um, off of Alton or something. I think this name of the street is Alton. I feel the that that comes to mind. But yeah, you know. So 
it's all these crazy cars outside, a bunch of young black dudes wearing big t-shirts and big ass, you know, pants and shit like that. Big chains. Big chains and braids and all kind of shit and dreads and, you know, and these two military style security guards on either end of the block in the neighborhood. So people are jogging by. <laughs> it looks like Manuel Noriega is in there. The military with his guards are for you. Yes. <laughs> hired by Beach or somebody. Yeah, I, I, I made you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then Suge comes. It's Big Meech. Raised by Woods is a must read, man. You need to read it twice to understand and fully grasp where Cavario is coming from. Raised by wolves, inside the life and mind of a guerrilla hustler. Intro. As a child, in the constant presence of gangsters, I overheard a lot. I remember hearing it said that it's better to be feared than to be loved. I remember gangsters who tried to live on love, and I remember that it almost always ended badly for them. But then, many of the feared didn't fare too well either. I remember an afternoon in a Harlem classroom long ago, after collecting a writing assignment from me. My first grade teacher, whose name I no longer recall, said, you write well, Cavario. You could be a writer. I remember sneering and remarking, a writer? <laughs> I'm going to be a gangster. The block getting scarred up, rob em. Meet you up edge comb, the dead zone Base heads is happy, crooks is tacky Five dollar hustlers, sharp as fuck Rockin' khaki, niggas in the hallway Rollway, one light out Waitin' to stick up the slide to the hideout Gangsters been blowin' piff We gotta hold the gift, live it Bad timing, man, get time on the average When I'm fuckin', the fars that let go I'm struttin', hundred pellets in your face chucklin' Niggas is niggas, but that ain't me I'm a super nigga